you know, people are always joking about like everything you learn pushes something out. Well, super learners don't abide by that rule. When you get down to like, how do you actually improve memory in the human brain? There's really three things. Absolutely. I always like to tell people learning is the only skill that matters. And so in, in every individual thing that you can pursue, it comes down to isolating those usually three things, committing them to memory in a really smart way, and then ultimately applying. You are listening to the Optimal Performance Podcast. The OPP is brought to you by Natural Stacks, makers of 100% natural and open source supplements designed to help you live optimal. For more information on building optimal mental and physical performance into your life, visit naturalstacks.com or keep it right here listening to the OPP. Ryan Muncy is probably the smartest guy I know. Trust me, Muncy is the nutrition guy. Ryan Muncy's out there trying to make the world better for all of us. The Optimal Performance Podcast is bold, edgy, creative, entertaining, and epic. Ryan Muncy is my go-to guy. Ryan Muncy is he's the first guy I call. He's making people's lives better. Ryan Muncy's an innovator. Hey guys, Ryan Muncy here, your host of the OPP, and today we've got a really cool episode for you. We're talking with Jonathan Levy. Jonathan is uh, the host of the Be- Becoming Superhuman podcast, where I was a guest a few weeks ago. Uh, he and I really hit it off, and uh, when I found out what Jonathan does, I really wanted to get him uh, on our show for you guys. Um, Jonathan is a serial entrepreneur, considers himself a life hacker just like us, uh, and he's a super learner. And through his podcast and online courses, uh, Jonathan has helped over 70,000 people uh, become better learners, more efficient learners. And as as people like us on, uh, you know, who listen to the Optimal Performance Podcast, this was definitely something that uh, we couldn't pass up this opportunity to get Jonathan on the show. So, So Jonathan, thanks for hanging out with us. Really looking forward to this. Pleasure to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So before we dive in, for all you guys listening, make sure you go to naturalstacks.com. You'll be able to see the video version of this along with any of the links to the resources and and things that we talk about on this episode. Uh, Make sure you go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review, let us know how much you like the show. Uh, We will read more reviews on the air. The only reason we're not is because I haven't gone on and grabbed any to read them. That is completely my fault. I apologize. And uh, I promise you next episode we will read two or three to make up for my lack there. And uh, if we read your uh, review on the air, we will hook you up with free Natural Stacks products. So uh, there's incentive to leave us a great review. Uh, and, And as always, share the OPP with your friends, your family, anybody you know who will benefit from the things that we're doing here. Uh, We're really trying to help people educate themselves and and lead better lives. And, uh, you know, uh, we would think and hope that if it's helping you, you would want to help other people too. So, So please share what we're doing here and help us reach more people. Public service announcement is over. Jonathan, let's do this thing. You consider yourself a super learner. What does that mean to you? Yeah, so great question, Ryan. I would say a super learner is anyone who's able to quickly and effortlessly learn any multitude of subjects, right? So, you know, people are always joking about like everything you learn pushes something out. Well, super learners don't abide by that rule. They consume and they kind of voraciously consume new content, new information, new subjects, new fields of study, uh, and they're able to do that without having to think about it. So, if you were to ask me who are some famous or, or commonly known super learners, uh, I would throw out David Heinemann or Hansen. I mean, this guy is a successful entrepreneur, software developer, and race car driver. I'd throw out guys like Tim Ferriss, Elon Musk, who've been so successful in many industries. I'd even throw out someone like Ben Franklin. Uh, and all of these people are people who succeed in various avenues of their lives, and they do it by learning more effectively and more quickly. So I love the fact that you threw in Ben Franklin. <laughs> You've got like all these new age guys and then you have the, the OG Ben Franklin. But it, it, as you you say this, you know, super learners don't abide by that rule or that dogma. Mm-hmm. Is, is it a mindset? Is it 
uh, is it something that they just say, okay, I don't buy into that conventional wisdom and I'm going to go my own way? Or is it, uh, is it a hardware software thing? So I think it starts with a mindset. I think you have to have the mindset just like you have to have the mindset that, you know, physically you're not limited in order to do something like listen to OPP. You have to be the kind of person who says like, you know what? I don't have to have a 10 minute mile. Like I can figure this out. Right. Uh, it starts with the mindset, but then it is very much a software upgrade, uh, hardware upgrade. We talk about a little bit and, and, you know, as you and I have talked about nootropics a lot. So there are ways to upgrade, uh, the firmware, if you will, the stuff that's actually running inside the hardware and then also the hardware itself, you can upgrade with things like meditation, uh, which again, you and I have discussed before, but it's definitely a software upgrade. It's learning to use your brain the way that evolution intended and not the way that kind of our mass education system teaches us to learn. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, <laughs> so I guess before we get into you know some of these tips that you have to help us upgrade our software and get away from that conventional learning uh, style. How did you develop a passion for this? What, what made you want to get into this? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, I, Ryan, always struggled as a student. I recently went back home to my parents' house and I was like, can you guys show me some of my report cards? Like I was super curious, you know, if this was a narrative that I kind of came up with after the fact. And I looked at him and it was like, you know, Jonathan needs to apply himself more. Jonathan can't sit still. Jonathan can't pay attention, needs to stop being class clown. I mean, I really struggled in school uh, to the point where it became a matter of kind of self-confidence and self-esteem. I felt like I was the dumbest kid in the class. I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like I didn't have the social skills, not to mention the academic skills. Uh, and things turned around for me uh, when I discovered prescription medication, right? Because then I was finally able to learn like the other kids. I could sit down and I could, I could, I still struggled. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Like I still struggled. I worked my butt off through high school. I worked my butt off through university. But finally, I was at least able to keep pace. And then I realized many years later when I met someone who had this ability, right? So he and his wife had learned and developed and studied and done intensive teacher training courses and all kinds of stuff on what they were calling accelerated learning and it was basically speed reading and memory techniques you know at the time first i said speed reading's bs i've tried three different speed reading books and programs that my parents bought me you know the first time i came home with c's and d's and um well never d's but c's let's put it that way uh and Second of all, like, what do you mean memory techniques? Like, isn't it just a matter of either you remember something or you don't and you have to review it, you know, five times or 10 times or seven times or whatever it is they say in order to remember it. Uh, and that opened up this whole new world to me that then I'd always been kind of a biohacker. I really liked all the like Tim Ferriss books and stuff like that. And I always thought it was so interesting that if you eat this way or you eat this way, your muscles and your body will respond differently. And I used to do all kinds of tests on myself and experiments. And um, But I never realized that that extended to the brain beyond popping pills. I always thought if I wanted to upgrade the hardware, I had to take medication, neurotropics, whatever it might be. Uh, and immediately, once I, once I learned about the skill, I had to learn it, obviously. Like I said, I'd tried so many times to learn speed reading before. Uh, and then everything changed for me. I mean, suddenly, I was headed off to a condensed 10-month MBA program. And I had this sense of dread because even before we started, they signed us 1,200 pages of reading. And I'm thinking to myself, like, most people are going to work up until a week before or a month before the MBA. Like, and suddenly it just became like this fun challenge. Like, how do I, how do I consume more information faster and remember with higher clarity, higher quality? So, yeah. And, and since then I've, uh, I've been using the skill ever since. <laughs> well, and that's, I, I may be getting ahead of ourselves, but I, this was something I was going to ask you after you taught us, you know, kind of some of these tricks, but sure. if, if you're able to consume significantly more information or information at a faster pace, mm. you know, are you able to retain it and use it? And, you know, as, as we've talked about on the show before, you know, information without, uh, uh you know, implementation is, is mm -hmm. basically wasted or useless. So are you able to 
implement all of these things? Is there a point of diminishing returns for, for consuming you know, so much information if, if you, oh, I'm so glad if you, you asked actually that. do anything with it? I'm so glad yeah. you asked that because what I'm going to do is, is tie it in a little bit to how one of the three core aspects of how the methodology works. And it's this idea, uh, it's basically called Hebb's Law. Right, which says neurons that fire together wire together. Meaning, right. basically, if you reduce that down to what it actually means, it's the more interconnected your knowledge is, the better. Right. So when someone tries to learn a new language and they go about it treating it as a new language, it's ten times more difficult than saying, "Okay, wow, you have this language Russian. It uses this Cyrillic alphabet. Let me branch out from that the things that I learned." Right. So some of these characters. I kind of recognize from the Greek alphabet that I learned in my fraternity. And some of these words I kind of recognize from Spanish. And you start to connect all your pre-existing knowledge. So the beauty of this method is the more you learn, the more you're able to learn, right? So I'm now learning my fourth language. I want to learn a fifth language next year. And people are always like, well, don't you confuse them? Don't you get bleed? And I go, no way. Like Russian grammar has helped me understand even English so much more effectively because now I understand when Russian speakers say like, oh my God, this language is so rigid, it's so constricting, I understand why. And I can take all the other languages, all the other sounds that I'm learning from Russian and apply them. I have a whole new library of neurons to map onto. And so it's exactly that. What you said is exactly right. If you don't use it, you lose it. And the idea is to, as you acquire knowledge, map it on to pre-existing neural networks. So you told me something in our podcast interview about this exam that you can take that mm-hmm. tells you if you're dopamine dominant, serotonin dominant, GABA dominant, so on and so forth. So I take that knowledge and I just map it on to everything that I already know about serotonin and everything I already know about you. And then all knowledge just becomes an expansion of knowledge rather than one more thing to remember. And in doing so, reinforces everything that you learn. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, so so you can let's tell get I care right. about this stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I can, and, and and let's get right into it. So, yeah. I mean, obviously, you've been doing this for for a while. Mm-hmm. You've come across a lot of different tips mm-hmm. and tricks. Mm-hmm. What are the ones that have had the biggest return for yeah. you? Yeah, so I'll break it down to you. It's uh, it's basically three components when it comes to memory, right? We can talk about speed reading and all that stuff separately. When it comes to memory, there's a hundred even a thousand guys out there like me, and there have been for the last 2,200 years, and we're all saying the same stuff, right? Uh, and ultimately, if you want to learn it from me or you want to learn it from someone else, it's a matter of, of fine-tuning and, and teaching style. But when you get down to like, how do you actually improve memory in the human brain, there's really three things. So the first one is connecting to pre-existing knowledge, right? So If you look, there's a 1955 piece of research that came out by a guy named Malcolm Knowles. He talks about the prerequisites for the adult brain to learn, and this is one of the things. Kids, you can tell them new information, and everything is kind of new and exciting, and they'll learn it. Uh, You need to connect to preexisting knowledge and have pressing need for the adult brain to really learn. So you have to look at new subjects and say, how is this similar to information that I already know? And the next and most powerful piece is visual information, right? So we're very visual creatures. Throughout evolution, the information that's been so dominant in survival is visual information, right? So where are things really, really important? Like where's my tribe? Where did I bury my winter food? How do I get to the water? Very important stuff. Uh, what, What food is poison? What food is not? So colors, shapes, sizes, all these things are super important. And also knowing, hey, if someone's painted this way, they're dangerous, and if someone's painted this way, they're not. So our visual memory is significantly stronger than our auditory memory. And so what that means is when I want to learn something new, right? So uh, just today I had to call and get a new credit card. My credit card got demagnetized. So I'm going to have a fun learning challenge uh, that might take people, I don't know, how long would it take you to memorize a credit card, like half an hour? I'm going to do it in about 30 seconds. But the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to convert that string of 16 digits into a visual symbol. And then I'm going to go to the third and most kind of third most important tip of learning, which is spaced repetition. So there's a basic curve of forgetting. There was a guy named Ebbinghaus. 
Herman Ebbinghaus. You see, I had to trace that back through the kind of connection of how I get to and how I learned about his name. And Ooh. what he did is study nonsense syllables, po, p, pi, poo, for like years, and then mapped out how long he would remember them. And what he figured out is you have a curve that goes like this and then like this. And for those who are listening on the audio, it's basically that curve gets pushed out and becomes flatter over time. So the first time you learn something, you forget it in a day, second time, five days, so on and so forth. And so what we do uh, in the super learned methodology is I'm the first to tell you with these techniques, right? And, and all this visualization, all this pre-connecting, you'll remember stuff for three days instead of a day. Right, that's already a 300% improvement. But if you want to remember stuff long term, it's exactly what you said, Ryan. You've you've got to use this stuff on regular intervals, and you can hack that interval. You can use software that calculates based on difficulty of whatever it is that you're trying to learn and based on your responses how often you have to. So there are some words in the Russian language that I only have to review once every 30 years. But uh, other words that I'm still learning, I have to review every single day. And so knowing how to do that and then implementing smart systems, right? So you read a book, know that you need to flip through that book again in two weeks. And then you need to flip through it again in three months and so on and so forth. And that's it. I mean, that's accelerated learning and memory in a nutshell. Those three techniques will take you so incredibly far. Uh, and they are connect everything you learn to pre-existing knowledge in some way, visualize everything you want to learn, and create complex visualizations and then review on regular intervals. Nice, nice. <laughs> now, uh, you and I have talked about this before we, we recorded that we've had several other memory champions, mm -hmm. actually three on the show previously. And, uh, you know, for, for our listeners, if you guys haven't listened to those episodes, go back and do that. Uh, Alex Mullen, uh, Matthias Ribbing, and Lewis Angel. And, mm -hmm. and all three of those guys talked about, as you said, anybody who's had success with this realizes that visual memory is Absolutely. incredibly strong. Uh, you're making an image. There, there's, there's different techniques or different ways to do it, but you're converting to some kind of an image that mm -hmm. sticks with you. Mm -hmm. You're reviewing it at those intervals so that you move it from short term to long term memory. Precisely. Uh, so yeah, that's all great. Uh, do you have any specific strategies that, that you use? Um, you know, I guess, like you said, with speed reading, and, and I know we'll get to that, but I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of our listeners have, have heard this before and, and maybe it didn't stick. So, so the same way that whatever clicked with you for speed reading, yeah. is there something that, that you could offer our listeners that might help them, you know, get this memory thing to click? Definitely. So I think a lot of times people learn about the theory of this stuff and they don't mm -hmm. practice it. And, and I think that that's probably the biggest challenge that I see with my students is ultimately this comes down for a lot of people to a creativity problem, right? Like, well, how do I convert the name Ryan Muncy into an image? And until you actually start practicing, you're not going to break uh, your creative chops on the problem. Uh, and so I think like, if you want to, if you want to have a better memory, practice memory techniques, use mnemonic techniques. And mm -hmm. it sounds like a silly tip, but I can't tell you like, there are specific techniques that I was teaching, like the memory palace technique, which I knew worked very well. And I was teaching them for years before I actually sat down and fully used them to their potential, right? So the memory palace technique for anyone who doesn't know is you take those visual symbols, you put them in physical locations. I'm sure you guys have covered this. Matthias uses, basically every memory champion uses it. But until you actually sit down and go like, okay, uh, here's a list of a hundred people's names and birthdays that I need to remember in my company. And you actually chew on these challenges. You're never going to, you're never going to get any better and you're never going to overcome because ultimately you have to adapt the method to things that work for you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think that's such a crucial point. Like so many of my students are like, I'm doing all the exercises online. I'm doing all these games. I'm watching all these lectures and I, I still don't get it. I still can't hack this thing. And I was like, well, what was the last thing you memorized in your personal life? And they go, well, what do you mean? And I go, well, are you using the techniques? Are you, are you applying them to things that you care about? Uh, and ultimately, like, 
look, this stuff is is not easy. It's it's not as easy as as popping uh, popping Ritalin and suddenly being able to you know focus more. It takes work, and until you see those rewards actually paying off in your day to day life, uh, you're not going to put in the work. So, uh, two things I'll say on this: uh, it, it was it was Alex Mullen. That was the episode where we went really in depth on Memory Palace. So, if you guys want to pursue that, go back and check out that episode. I don't remember what number that was, um, but on the blog post for this podcast, I will link back to that episode so that you guys, if, if you hadn't haven't heard that one and you want to go back and learn about Memory Palace, mm. you can uh, go really in depth with that one with Alex. Um, and then the second thing, as you're saying this, you know, I just saw a, a picture yesterday that had the quote on it that says the arena is still uh, the best teacher. And yeah. it's so true, no matter what your pursuit, you know, I, I'm, I'm working with a couple of people, um, you know, who, you know, the, the one guy says the thing holding him back is not being able to cook. And it's like, well, learn you how have to cook. Do- you have to do what we all did. You have to get in the kitchen. You know, Stephen Pressfield's quote is, you know, if you want to be a painter, you've got to get your ass in front of the easel. And um, you're not going to become good at anything without doing it. The first time we do things, we're, we're never as good as we are the totally. thousandth time totally. or whatever. So, so as you're saying, you've got to practice these things. You've got to do them and use them. Yeah. So. Well, and let me toss in a, a learning tip here since, as you said, you guys have had a lot of memory. I want to bring some new stuff. Uh, and okay. I think – what I've found, and and a lot of my work for the last few years is, okay, we have these memory techniques. I want to help people learn everything, right? right. You want to learn Russian? Cool. You want to learn piano? Like, me too. I, I have one right over there. You want to learn acro yoga? Like, me too. I'm, I'm working on that. And so I've been applying all this knowledge um, towards the randomest stuff that I can find. And what I figured out is oftentimes you can crystallize things down into three pieces, right? So this is something I haven't even really put into my course. But when I went rock climbing for the first time ever, I was able to like very, very quickly get up the wall. And when I went golfing for the first time ever, the instructor thought I was like playing a joke on him. It's because I isolate all the noise and then I focus on these three things and I commit them to memory using these techniques. So right in rock climbing, the most important thing is control the distance of the body from the wall, right? Like that's the first and most important thing. But so many people are caught up with like, how should my fingers be and which hand should I use? Ultimately, none of that stuff matters. And so in, in every individual thing that you can pursue, it comes down to isolating those usually three things, committing them to memory in a really smart way, and then ultimately applying, like I said, like, how can I take what I know about human physiology and apply it to acro yoga? Well, mm. I know that the femur is the strongest bone in the human body. So I know somehow if I'm going to be supporting three people's weight on top of me, I need to figure out the actual alignment of the femur, right? And I know that every time that this movement happens, there's going to be this kind of rotation and the pressure is going to be, and, and basically you're taking existing knowledge and you're applying it in, in new and innovative ways. Well, and that's kind of the, the crux of, to me, when we talk about biohacking or life mm-hmm. hacking, any, anything, you know, a hacker is someone who seizes control of a system in order to seize control of it and manipulate it, bend it to your will. You have to understand how it works. Absolutely. So, so you're looking, you're looking to understand things at that, you know, most fundamental level. And then how do we manipulate this to get the desired result that we want? Absolutely. I always like to tell people learning is the only skill that matters because if you know how to learn, you can do, be, or become anything you want, right? Like you want to be charismatic. That's a learning challenge. You want to be better at sports. That's for the most part, a learning challenge. Sometimes it's a physical challenge. You want to be better at music. That's a learning challenge. You want your manager's job. That's definitely a learning challenge, right? Um, it might be learning, you know, politics, but it's a learning challenge one way or another. Very true. Very true. All right. So we, we covered a little bit of memory, a little bit of learning. Let's talk speed reading. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am I am one of those people who, and, and again, this is kind of like what I was saying earlier, where I think one of my, I don't, I don't want to call this a pet peeve, but you know, the, the idea of reading books to collect a library, a bookshelf to say, Hey, look what I read. Mm. I don't necessarily think that that makes you a better human being. It's, it's, you're only a better human being if you apply those things into your life, you implement, um, you know, so, so with speed reading, 
I guess my, before we even get into this, my, my caution to our, our listeners would be, you know, speed reading is great if you do something with the information that you I take in. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree so, more. And that's, that's one of the most important things, in fact. So how do we speed read? I, I, yeah. I consume most of my books through audio um, okay. on one and a half or, or two speed. But if we were to read, what, what do we do? So there's a couple basic principles with speed reading. The first one is optimizing the efficiency of eye movements. So first and foremost, when your eye is actually moving, it's not consuming new information, right? The optic nerve is effectively shut off. It's something called cicadic masking or cicadic blindness. Uh, so the first thing is move your eye less. Instead of moving once every word, you know, for a couple of millimeters, move your eye two to three times. Then effectively you double the amount, the, the bandwidth of information getting to the brain. That's a simple one. And, and anyone who wants to cite research about speed reading being controversial, like simple fact, not controversial. If your eyes are moving more, you're getting less information at a slower rate. The next thing that's not at all controversial, so many people move their eye all the way to the edge of the column. When in fact, you know, my dad always used to tell me, like, make sure you read the black stuff, not the white stuff. And if you're moving your eye all the way to the edge of the column, further than you need to, to use the little bit of peripheral vision outside the fovea, which is your, your focal area, then you're wasting. It's a lot of waste. Uh, so you move your eye to the end of the first word instead of all the way to the column. And then the third thing, which is more difficult and more advanced, is the suppression of subvocalization. So our brains can process spoken word at, like you said, about 2x speed on a podcast. Average person speaks around 140, 150 words a minute, depending on the podcast. <laughs> but that puts you at around 300 words a minute, right? Uh, and most people read just about there, 250 words a minute when they read normally. And that's because they're using auditory processing to hear. But in fact, text is visual information. They're images. They're not very descriptive images because they all look very similar. But, you know, the word Ryan is a visual symbol for the sound Ryan, but also for the concept Ryan. And so what you effectively want to do in speed reading is minimize. You can never eliminate subvocalization. You'll always hear some of the words in your head, but the fewer you hear, it's just like looking at a picture. You look at a picture and you don't think red car, beautiful woman, bikini. You just understand the contents of that visual image. Of course, with text, like I said, it's, it's much more difficult than that. They say with a picture, it's a thousand words, right? And you can literally consume a thousand words in a fraction of a second. Well, with text, we want to try and get more towards that area of processing in the brain. And so you're trying to consume the symbols as they are on the page without converting them to spoken word. And doing that, I mean, there's, there's controversy here as well, right? Because the world record in speed reading is about 4,500 words a minute. Now, I've never met anyone who can do more than about 1,200 personally. Uh, and the average student that we see go through our course does about 600, 700. And, and that's what the research supports. Most of the research says, look, after 600 or so words a minute, you're losing comprehension significantly. But the takeaway there for me, I think that's always interesting when people send me this article, right? The takeaway is not, oh, speed reading's a scam because it only goes to 600. It's, oh my God, you can go to 600 words a minute without sacrificing comprehension. And I think that's yeah. incredible. Yeah, I mean, I'm just doing the math in my head. I mean, that's two to three times more information in, in any given block of time, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm not going to say it's easy, right? It's, it's very hard. Like, I'm known to sit on the couch on Saturday and I'll speed read for like an hour and then I'll just pass out. Like, it's exhausting. It's like taking an SAT. But at the end of the day, like, when, <laughs> you know, when I screw up and I forget to write the questions for a guest and I have half an hour to read like some of their recent work, a few of their blog posts, their entire bio, their entire Wikipedia page. I can do that in five minutes. Yeah, you know, it comes and, in very handy. And write a ton of questions. And, and when I want to read a book, uh, you know, I can, I can comfortably read at 450 words a minute instead of 250. And that means like getting a book done yep. in half the time. <laughs> You know, that that's a very interesting point. And we talk about this a lot. You know, my background is in gyms and, and strength and, and mm -hmm. physical fitness. And, uh, you know, 
we talk a lot about raising absolute ceilings, absolute yes. strength, absolute work capacity, whatever it is. You know, you raise the ceiling, so then your your operational capacity comes up. Yes. You know, so so like if we have a marathon runner, we increase their their strength, their power, their their top end speed. You know, their marathon time is going to get faster because they can run. You know, seventy percent is now a faster pace than it used to be. I love so, that. Like you just said, you know, if, if you increase your top end potential for, for the information that you can consume, your reading speed goes up to, you know, if my max now is 300 and it goes up to 600, like you said, I could comfortably read at 400, which right. is, is higher than, you know, what it used to be. And I can consume more information, retain more of it. I um, really like that. that. I, I'm going to quote I'm you not, actually on that. I want to put I want to put a chapter about that into into my course because so many of my students are like, well, well, your top speed is 800. Why can't I read 800? And I'm like, yeah, if I read at 800 words a minute in 10 minutes, I'm going to be napping on the desk. Like I usually read around 600, 650. And I think that's mm-hmm. a really important point to make to people is like the, the idea is to have the skill in your back pocket. Yeah, it's that's the thing that to me in the, in the physical stuff that that you know well, that's where my background was. Strength is I think it's Charles Staley who is the strength coach that that this quote comes from. But strength is the adaptation that leads to all other adaptations. Mm-hmm. And you know if if you want to get faster, if you want to lose fat, it, it, if you get stronger, then anything you do, you're either using more weight, you're resting right. less time because that that operational capacity is now. Uh, you're either working at a lower percentage than you previously had to, or you're using a higher load than, you know, you previously were able to. So you get any of those other adaptations and, and that's, it's exactly what you're talking about with you raise the top end and then operational capacity also increases. And that's, I I, I think that's so true for, for any pursuit that we have. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we came up with that together. Yeah, I wouldn't, I'm I wouldn't, totally going to quote you. You're going to see. I have this fancy studio. I got to use it to improve my my courses, right? <laughs> nice, nice. Um, okay, so any other uh, speed reading tips? That's pretty much it. I mean, I always tell people it, it'll take me 10 minutes to explain to you. And, you know, Tim Ferriss posted this blog post, like in, increase your, double your reading speed in 10 minutes. And you actually can do it, right? It'll take 10 months to get your comprehension up. Maybe not 10 months, but 10 weeks is usually the figure that we quote to actually bring your comprehension up. And I'm glad you mentioned weight training because I actually drew from weight training in the way that I train my students. Uh, And I'm sure you're familiar and I'm sure your audience is familiar with this idea of progressive overload. But I'll kind of paraphrase it for the one person in the audience who's never heard of it. And it's this idea that like as soon as you get to a certain level, you raise your level up and essentially you're kind of lifting a little bit heavier than is comfortable and allowing the body to adapt and catch up. And we do the same thing with speed reading. I'm instead of, and I think where so many reading courses go wrong is they're like, okay, just read faster now. And and it's kind of like uncomfortable. And it's it's kind of like me telling you, all right, just, if you want to, if you want to bench press 200 kilos, like just go and bench press 200 kilos. When in fact, what you need to do is go up in steps and in stages. And so what we do is we tell people, Read a, read a little bit faster than you can comprehend, allow comprehension to catch up rather than trying to push your comprehension. So there is this really frustrating period. And I remember when I was learning, just being like, this, this, this stuff doesn't work. Like there's this frustrating period where you're, you're reading faster than you can. And it's very similar to doing a set of curls and knowing that you're supposed to do seven and you can only do five. You're reading and you're going, oh my God, I'm only getting 50% of what's on this page. And then eventually you catch up. And as soon as you catch up, you go to the next level and then to the next level. And that's, that's exactly how we train is uh, progressive overload. It reminds me a lot of, uh, I've seen Stephen Kotler speak, uh, about the flow state. And, and that is a lot of how our brain in, it goes through a cycle. And, and there's a really cool image that, uh, he presented in that presentation. I've got it somewhere. I, if I can find the image, I'll put it on the blog post for this episode. But you know, we start in what he calls the struggle phase where you have to assimilate information you learn and, and then you actually have to take a break, get away from it. And then you come back, you're, you've kind of assimilated and, and you're, you're more familiar with this thing. So we could never get into a flow state right. in, in something that is new to us. Right. Um, you know, so it's like if, if you go snowboarding for the first time, 
day one is all struggle and, and assimilation and accumulation of information. You go home, you sleep. The next day, you may not be, you know, Sean White, but you can kind of, you see huge progress and, and you can get, I don't want to call that the flow state on day two of snowboarding, but sure. that's sort of how the brain works. And, Absolutely. Uh, and it's an it, important it's, point you make also about sleep, which is too many people try and force the brain when in fact, like I teach a course on, on learning and being more productive and it has a whole section on sleep. Cause like, that's one of the best accelerated learning tips you can have, like read something, take a nap, push that. Well, I was going to point out. I was going to point out that, that that's exactly what you're doing. You said on a right. Saturday, speed read for an hour and then pass out. And, you know, yeah. instantly I'm like, well, I, I wonder if he knows that like that's helping. Very with deliberate. Uh, also, yeah. I, I can't help it because I get super sleepy. But <laughs> but yeah, it's, but it's I think very that's, deliberate. that's a sign of like your brain is saying like, hey, this is what we need at this time. Yeah. Well, the brain produces metabolites when you're learning. Like People don't realize, but there's actual there's a waste byproduct in the brain that can only be cleared during sleep. So people think like drinking coffee or actually, interestingly enough, I recently learned that it may be able to be cleared during meditation as well. But, uh, until I see the research myself, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna believe it. So there's actual, just like there's lactic acid in the muscles, there's mm -hmm. actual byproduct in the brain and it actually needs to be cleared. And when you feel that pressure sensation, it's called sleep pressure. It's literally the buildup of waste. And I think that's so fascinating. Like these are the kinds of random too. things that I love to learn. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and we talk about that all the time with sleep and you know, we tell people that you do, you have these metabolic byproducts that accumulate and the only right. time that your brain can, can detoxify and dump those things is when you sleep. So, you know, if you're not sleeping, you're not clearing that waste, you're not able to you know, have a brain that functions, you know, totally. anywhere near it's, it's peak or, or it's potential. So, um, with that said, what are some of your favorite sleep hygiene tactics? Oh yeah. So I, you can't see here, but, uh, everywhere in the house, the entire house has a sunset mode and a, nice. and a waking mode. So, and normally, so I have everything white right now. So your recording isn't yellow, but it's, uh, about an hour past sunset here. And normally all my screens would be yellow. All the lights would be yellow. And I'm like fanatical about this. So there's a couple devices in the house that don't work this way. Like my TV doesn't work this way. I try not to watch TV at night, but my Kindle has a white background. So I've got yep. the blue blocker sunglasses. So that's tip number one is like be super fanatical about light exposure. What were you going to say? I mean, I'm going to give you a tip on, on light there. Go uh, check out Drift TV. Uh, it's a little box. You can, yeah, Drift TV. Sick. and. And for you guys listening, we'll put a link to this on the website. Um, but it, it does for your TV what flux and oh, blue blocking what? screens and stuff do for your computer. Yeah, that's awesome. I've set up a mode on my TV, like I've I've taken over one of the user modes, and it's pretty yellow. But yeah, I, I need that. So that's so. Sorry, go ahead. Well, on, on your well, I, I want to know more about your your sunset setting on your your lights. Yeah, is that is that like, are they LED lights controlled yeah, they're by? All, like, they're all control. LED. And for people who are uh, watching the video right now, I can uh, show them. Like, I think this is the office setting. Let's see. They're all, uh, no, I changed the bulb before this episode. So I guess we're not going to get a live demo. But basically, okay. uh, all the lights in the house are LED. They're controlled by the smartphone and they all are set to timers. So everything, what's bothering me right now, I just moved to a new place and one of the lights isn't. And it just drives me nuts. But like everything's set to turn more and more progressively yellow and even mm -hmm. towards the red orange mm -hmm. spectrum. And it gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And then in the morning, I used to wake up with whiter light. I interviewed uh, Stephen Folks on our show. And mm -hmm. he actually told me that you need red rich because I realized actually the sunset is pretty, or the sunrise, I'm sorry, is pretty red. So right. I'm playing around with that. And then I just ordered some uh, like blinds automatic blinds for the whole house that are going to be on a timer. So, nice. uh, I want to wake up with real actual sunlight in the morning. Yeah. So nice. that, that sleep hack number one, like that's my favorite one. And people don't realize it. Like up until recently, you know, the iPhone didn't have this night shift mode and people would always ask me, I always thought it was so clear. They're like, why is your phone so yellow? And I'm like, Oh, do you know what you're <laughs> doing to your brain and your body? It's so bad. And, yeah. and then they're like, I don't get it. Like, I can't fall asleep till two in the morning. I'm just like, yeah, obviously like, right. right. 
So uh, I'll get you, after we finish recording, I'll get you to send me links to the lights that you're using. We'll yeah, put those absolutely. links in the show notes as well. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. All right, so we got light. What other sleep hygiene hacks or tips? Yeah, so I take magnesium every night before bed. Uh, magnesium's really, really interesting. Uh, he- here's a, a little mnemonic memory trick that I did. Uh, men need 400 milligrams of magnesium a day. Women need 300. That's a lot. That's a lot of magnesium. And something like 70% of people are magnesium deficient. And while we're throwing out uh, you know, numbers and facts, and now I'm just showing off, right? But magnesium is used in between 1,200 and 1,400 processes in the body, many of which happen at night. So all that like good brain maintenance, obviously muscle maintenance, magnesium is used for everything. So I take uh, magnesium, specifically I take magnesium uh, glycinate before bed, really, really important. And uh, I also try to consume a lot of water about three hours before bed. Hydration is super important for muscular repair. And I feel like I'm telling you stuff that you know better than me. But in any case, these are the reasons well, I, that I do it. As, as, you, as you bring up MagTech, and our, our listeners are probably very familiar with uh, our mag, right. or use of magnesium. But I say MagTech. That's just right. what I'm used to saying. Our MagTech product is is a phenomenal magnesium complex where we actually have uh, the glycinate that you mentioned, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. taurate, and magnesium L3 and 8, which I was going to ask you if you're familiar with. So if- you're the one who told me about this. And if I okay. weren't so cheap, I would have already thrown out all the glycinate. But I want to finish it before I order MagTech. And I remember because I it got you, like, you, like I, I know you want increased synapse density and take yeah. those neural cells from gray to green. Yeah, yeah. I just got to go through all this uh, all this stuff that I bought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to get some of that stuff because I had never heard of it of three and eight. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Okay. Uh, okay. Anything else on sleep hygiene? Uh, so I nap. I, not as much anymore. I don't know why I got out of the rhythm, but uh, I think it's because I'm I'm. I have a new supplement routine and I'm pretty energized throughout the day, but historically I sleep twice a day. I think that's a really, really healthy thing to do, especially if you're in a learning intensive area and and you're in a brain intensive area. I used to wake up in the morning, learn a lot, and then I would take about a 30 minute nap. Realistically, 20 to 22 minute nap. I try never to let it go to 30. Uh, And I find that I actually sleep better on days that I've had that little nap. So I think that's that's probably my third tip for sleep hygiene. I could go in in depth. We had a really really great guest on our show who does all the actual sleep equipment for like Cristiano Ronaldo and and all the like world's top teams. He's the one who picks out their bedding when they travel. And so we did nice. a 1 hour episode on like what's the right mattress, what's the right pillows, how warm should you be, how cold should you be? Should you, I take a cold shower sometimes before bed, something that I've really started getting into with all the Wim Hof stuff and, and things that we've done on the show. But, uh, those are the, the majority of the hacks. I put a lot of time and effort into my sleep environment, my sleep routine. Okay. Very cool. Um, so we're getting close to the end of the show. I got a couple of kind of rapid fire questions that we want to throw at you. So with, with all of the books that you have consumed, Mm. Give us two or three that you think everybody should read. Oh, that's really tough. That's a really, really tough question because like I, I read pretty niche stuff. Like uh, okay. the first, I'll never forget the first book that I speed read, speed read was a 660 page anthology of body language. Cause I was like, damn it. Like I want to be more char- charismatic. Like I want people to like me more. Like I need to figure this out, but I don't think everyone should read that, you know? <laughs> um, for your listeners specifically, I would say, you know what? I'll, I'll give you an, I'll give you one that I really like. Rich Dad Poor Dad. Everybody should read that book. Every human being who lives in a capitalist society should read that book. Uh, yeah. Which, let's be honest, is is most human beings, unless you count China as a real communist society. I kind of don't. But in any case, uh, that's one that I think everyone should read. I think anyone who is open to the idea that life can be more and that there is more to your existence than the mundane should read a new earth by Eckhart Tolle. Uh, that book changed my life in ways it's, it's still continuing to change my life. It's kind of like the, the gift that keeps on giving. And then another book for any human being who ever uh, happens to encounter other human beings is Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. It's my favorite book of all time, Ryan. 
it's like another one that I, I come back to again and again and again. And in something like 120 pages, there's so much wisdom and I, I'm far from, I've read it 12 times maybe. And I'm far from perfecting everything in it. And it's such simple and elegant and beautiful stuff uh, that I think everyone should read. So there's three. A lot of, a lot of the rest of them are super esoteric. Okay. No, those are, those are great. Um, how old are you, Jonathan? I am 30 in March. So 29 at the time of this recording. Okay. So one of the questions that I like to ask some of our guests is, you know, what would you tell your 25 year old version of yourself? Oh, and I guess, I guess you're old enough where we can, we 20, can look back. So Maybe 25, 20, yeah. 23, somewhere in that range. Uh, let's go with, yeah, let's go with, can we go with 20? How do you feel about that? Let's do 20. 20. That works. Can I swear on the show? <laughs> you, you, you can swear. <laughs> so I would tell my 20 year old self to chill the fuck out. And, and also to look beyond your own kind of world and realize that there's so much more to life. And I probably hand him a copy of a new earth. It would have saved me five years. Um, and I, I think that, I think that would, that would do a lot. I, I realized recently, I don't think I could spend a lot of time with my 20 year old self which is an interesting, really? it's an interesting realization. I, I kind of thought back and I was like, wow, I don't think I could stand that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think the, you know, the, that's the point of life is to grow and evolve oh, yeah. and, and move forward. And, you know, oh, I yeah. think if, if you're the same person at 30 as you were at 20 or the same person at 50 as Absolutely. you were at 30, then you've failed yourself, uh, yeah. you know? So, uh, there's nothing wrong with looking back and totally. wishing, or, or, you know, being different now than you were then. Totally. So. I wouldn't change anything ultimately, but because I think I had to go through every single step to be open to the areas that I've grown and developed today. Uh, but yeah. And right. also I think I would yeah. say, trust the process. I like, yeah. trust that everything's going to be okay. And you're going to get exactly where you need to be. And I think that's where a new earth is so powerful. This idea that every experience you have is perfectly tailored for you. Uh, and for the evolution of your consciousness. You know, it's interesting. And I guess a lot of our listeners who, who have heard this question asked quite a few times uh, will have the same realization that I'm having uh, is that the answers to this question are not that different. Most yeah. people answer it in a, in a very similar way. So yeah. it, it's, that, it's usually like work less, spend more time with family and don't take yourself so seriously, which I think also would apply for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Jonathan, where can our listeners get more of you? Yeah. So the main, if you want to learn more about accelerated learning, you want to do a free trial of our course, there's no credit card required. Just check it out. Come test your reading speed, see what you have to gain. That one is at become a super Uh, if they want to get access to now going on a hundred free podcast episodes with some really phenomenal people, I mean, the Ryan Muncy's of the world, the top brass, then uh, that's at becomingasuperhuman.com. And ultimately, you can link them to jle.vi, and that'll get them everywhere they need to go. That has links to all the stuff I do. Okay, perfect. Uh, and thanks for the plug, by the way. Oh, an absolute pleasure. Thanks for being <laughs> on the show. Um, so one question before we let you go. Yeah. Uh, it looks like my video is frozen. Um, there we go. Is it moving now? Yep. It's the, the question that every guest has to answer. Your top three tips to live optimal. Ooh. Wow, that's a tough question. So I'm going to start with respect sleep. Like super simple. Respect okay. sleep. Actually, you know what? I already got them. Respect sleep. Learn. Like learn voraciously. Learn as much as you can. Learn about anything that interests you, even the slightest bit. And don't be ashamed when you end up in one of those Wikipedia spirals. Like if you're interested in something and you see a bunch of stuff, just learn. Just learn as much as you can. And then the third thing is is just be grateful. Be so grateful for everything that you have and all the opportunities because, I mean, 
If you're listening to this, you're so incredibly lucky. And if you're alive today, as opposed to a thousand years ago or a million years ago, you're so incredibly lucky. So try to go through life remembering that as often and as much as you can. Wow, that is some great stuff. Jonathan, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thank you for sharing your passion, your knowledge, and all this information that we can use to implement and and move our lives forward. For you guys listening, thank you for tuning in. As always, go to naturalstacks.com. You will be able to see the video version of this on the blog post. Follow all the links and resources. I've got a ton of notes, a lot of links for you guys to follow up on and and go down those rabbit holes. Uh, So again, go to naturalstacks.com. Please go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. Let us know how much you like the OPP. And of course, please share this with the people in your life who you know will benefit from the things that we've talked about here on this episode, but also uh, on the OPP as a whole. If it's helping you, if it's making your life better, share it with the people that you know uh, who will also benefit from this stuff. Uh, That helps us reach more people and helps us grow this movement. So uh, thank you guys for tuning in and we will talk to you next week.